So I want to give a framework of the world and fish and the information that is here comes from the FAO uh, State of the World Fisheries 2014. Basically it relates to statistics that are up to date to 2012 and there is a question of the accuracy of those statistics mainly to do, mainly to do with the fact that China is, you'll see in the statistics, more than 50% of the world's fish production and trade and nobody's really sure how accurate the statistics from China are. But if we look here, and I'll run through, run through these slides one by one, we're talking about world capture fisheries, that's people going out in boats and catching fish, hunter-gathering, we talk about what, happened, what we were talking about yesterday. Inland waters, there's about 12 million tons, and you can see the build-up from the 1950s to 2012. Marine, marine waters, close to 90 million tons of fish are caught every year, and you can start seeing that it plateaued in the 90s, it's bouncing along, I won't go through the whole thing, there, there are scientists that believe that we are now removing all the species from the sea and that in 2050 there will be very, very few species left. There are strong signs of this, if you, if you um, might have read that the uh, lobster fisheries in the world have suddenly exploded. Um, it, prices of lobsters have, have crashed and scientists predicted that because of the breakdown of the trophic uh, nature of the balance in the sea that would happen and it's beginning to happen. Let's look at the top, uh, the top uh, 15 producers of farmed species <coughs> in 2012. And the, I suppose uh, the important figure is the last one, don't even bother about the middle, is the percentage. So you can see that China farms 62% of the world's fish. So one in two kilograms of fish is being produced in China. The next after that is India. Uh, Vietnam, you can see it's very, very small. And if you look at us in Europe, you won't find us. And if you look at Egypt, for instance, which is number two, four, six, eight, nine in that list, and they produce about a million tons, that is a million tons of tilapia, or close to nearly all of it is tilapia, and that industry developed in the last 20 years. So, massive changes happening all the time. Um, this is a picture that divides between mariculture, which is production, farming in the sea, and farming in fresh water. And as you can see here, close to 40 million uh, tons is produced in fresh water, and somewhere in the region of 20 million tons is produced in the sea. Probably the great majority, or well, the number one C1 is the salmon, which is, you all know what salmon is. This is a table that shows world fisheries and quantities destined for export. The reason I put this up here is that you can see that the bottom line is the <clears throat> the total is the production, and this line here is export. So somewhere in the region of between two-thirds and a half of the fish that are caught or that are grown are shipped to other places around the world. And the meaning of that is that a lot of energy, a lot of the cost, 
is basically in trade. There's very little. Um, there's very little uh, observance of the fact that we take the fish and we eat it. It's we take the fish and we make a business out of it and we send it all over the world. And we're still stuck in that place. Um, this is the inland waters capture. It's a breakdown of who are the people that are catching freshwater fish in boats out of lakes, rivers, etc., etc. And you can see that the list is very different here. The list is very different. China is at 2.9 percent. Yeah. Uh, sorry, at a variation, they've increased by 2.9 percent, but. Catching in inland waters, India is growing very, very fast. There's continuous movement in how people are dealing with what they're dealing with in fish in the, in the world. The top 10 exporters and importers of fish. Who are the people that are trading these fish all around the world? So you'll see that the importers, the major, the major importer, is China, 15.1%. And if you look at the exporters, the major exporter is also China. So people are trading fish. Fish is a commodity. That's the way things have been looked at for a while. And will continue to be looked at. Look. And as I showed you, I think I showed you yesterday this, this table, 1970, about 5% of the fish that were eaten in the world came from aquaculture. In 2012 it was close to 50%, it's now much more than 50%. So the majority of fish are farmed. Let's look at the production. This is aquaculture production, not fish catch, fish production in farming by region. So if you look, if you look at Africa, it's about 2.2%. Uh, Americas, which includes South America and North America, it's about 5%. Uh, Asia, 88%. So fish farming, at the moment, it's mainly in Asia. If we look at Europe, Europe, total Europe is about 4.32%. So what we see is this enormous industry of bass and bream and trout and salmon is actually a very small percentage of what's going on in the world. This we, this we saw yesterday, the major production systems that are used in aquaculture, developed from ponds, went into cages, um, went into cages, um, into raceways, and finally into recycled aquaculture systems. The recycled aquaculture systems, let's be clear, have been around for 20 years, maybe a bit longer, but seriously looked at for 20 years, and very few of them are commercially successful. Some of them, some systems are commercially successful, smolts, production of salmon, a lot of them are not totally based on recycling, the part of them are flow through. Rob will no doubt talk more about that in, in, in his talks. Um, this really is a, uh, a graph that shows the issues that have been the challenges for aquaculture in intensification. I'm not going to talk now about what is the, uh, whether, whether it's been good or bad, but the system that we've lived in, certainly from the 1980s, is that profit is the rule. 
and to intensify and to make, make the, the system more efficient is the game. So what everybody did was try and grow more fish per cubic meter and deposit the issues aside. And what was faced was, first of all, as they increased the, de the densities, as I said yesterday, aeration became a problem. After that, solid removal, because there was a lot of waste. Uh, after that, ammonia becomes a limiting factor. And you can see at the end you're dealing with things like minor organic products that give taste uh, problems to the fish. So you'll get a situation where you, you, you have, I don't know the names of the chemicals, but they build up in the fish and you get what they call bad taste, foul taste. But I think what's important to understand in the whole process here, and it's very important when we come to talk about aquaponics, is that everything to do with intensification of fish farming is based on feed, <coughs> the amount of feed. If you look at agriculture as well, terrestrial agriculture, it's based on feeding the animals. And it's very, very similar in fish. But what happens when you feed a kilogram of, a kilogram of uh, a, a fish feed, and it doesn't matter if it's, um, if it's a synthesized feed through um, a, a professional fish, me a fish meal uh, operation, or whether it's a homegrown fish uh, formulation that is done in, in many parts. For instance, in Asia, the great majority of the feed that's going into the ponds there is either organic waste or homemade feeds. But when you put a kilogram of feed into a pond, it's going to have the following effects. It's going to take out between a quarter and a kilogram of oxygen out of the water. It's going to increase the alkalinity by four kilograms. It's going to produce somewhere in the region of the figure there, 0.35 to 1.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide and the amount of waste solids that comes out depending on the technology behind the feed is going to be between a quarter and half of the weight of that feed. You're also going to get between 0 0.025 and 0 0.055 kilograms of nitrogen as ammonia and that ammonia is toxic to the fish. So all of these factors are happening when you put one kilogram of feed in. Now, uh, to produce a ton of, feed, uh, of fish, how many tons of feed do you need to put in? Does anybody have any idea? It depends on the species. But give me a range. One kilogram uh, dry food uh, for one kilogram fresh weight. Oh. Yeah. Let's put, let's put it this way, um, uh, that will be wonderful, <laughs> that, that, that is a dream, but yes, it ranges between one to two kilograms, between one to two kilograms, and it depends on species, depends on feed, but the general direction is, so it means that if we produce a ton of fish, if a ton of fish come out of our aquaponic system, or our RS, or any other system, we put in let's say a ton and a half of feed. Yeah. Out of that ton and a half of feed, we've got solid waste, about 750 kilograms. So if, and it doesn't matter if it's your aquaponic tanks in, the, uh, in your spare room, or whether it's an aquaponic system, commercial system, on every kilogram of feed that you're putting into the system, somewhere in the region of half a kilogram of dry matter is going to come out somewhere. You're going to have to remove it. If you don't remove it, it's going to build up and it's going to pollute the thing. So the logic says let's deal with 
how do we get this out of the system initially? Now, that's totally oversimplified what I've said. Because actually, an aquaponic system is utilizing that to maintain its balance. And we'll try and get to that in the in, in the continuation. I just wanted to look, and I don't know if I think we'll, we'll rush through this, um, the various, I think it's important that you have this picture in your mind. These four systems that we talked about, cages, ponds, raceways, RAS. What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? Because by understanding the advantages and the disadvantages of those, you can understand what happens in your, in your system. I had a, um, I had a, a, a teacher, one of my teachers was a Japanese um, koi farmer. He was fourth generation. Uh, his great-great-grandfather started the farm. And <coughs> what, what I will learn in my lifetime will not be enough to understand what he had because he had received it from his father and his father beforehand and so on and so forth. And his knowledge was enormous. And he said basically, because we are very uh, westernized and diagnostic in the way we deal with issues. So one of the issues that you're gonna deal with in aquaponics is the health of your fish. And we'll get to the talk on the health of the fish after the break, but from my background, everything was on the basis of if the fish uh, are dying, you take them out, you, uh, you do a swab, you, do a, you put them under the microscope, you see what's happening, you diagnose it at that level. And his basic philosophy was, I grow water. If I can maintain the water quality at a level that is good for the fish, then <coughs> the fish are going to be fine. And so his viewpoint was, how do I get my diagnostics as to what is happening in this system? His way of doing it was to sit for half an hour, for an hour, for two hours, for as long as possible, that that was required next to the pond and look at the fish and decide what, what the issue was. And experience had showed him that that was the best diagnostic method. So, from that same viewpoint, I'm saying to you, I think you need to have a, 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 a wide view of the ontology of aquaculture, because that's what you're going to be dealing with in aquaponics. A lot of people will tell you you're dealing with um, growing vegetables. You're growing vegetables as well, and you're dealing with the whole thing but you're also growing fish. The fish are not there just to supply nutrients for your, uh, for your plants. So where we have an issue is that we have to become fish farmers and horticulturists together if we want to be aquaponic practitioners. Now, I think there's a, a pollution. If you are in inland water, mm -hmm. there should be a big pollution in around the, the cage. So you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. <clears throat> and if you notice in the cons, I put requires impact monitoring. Because there is an enormous potential to cage culture in the world. <clears throat> and not only a potential, it's being done. And what you just said applies to many situations. <clears throat> there was a, uh, a bitter and long court battle that I was uh, knowledge, that I had knowledge to in the Red Sea in Eilat, which is at the bottom of Israel. There was an enormous bass and bream farm and there is a, uh, a reef, a tropical reef. <clears throat> And the people that ran the observatory and the diving to the reef 
objected to the continuation of the fish farm because the feces of the fish was polluting the Dead Sea is a closed sea, so there was no flow out of there. And <clears throat> as a result of that, there was this enormous uh, battle. And at the end, the fish farm was changed. It was closed down, and they have gone inland, and now they have to produce their fish with a filtration of the water as it goes out back into the sea, because they still have to di dispose of their water. So. There is, an, there, there is a two sides to that question. But if you take the, the basis to what we're actually doing in aquaponics, and I showed you yesterday that you can take small and larger systems and you can produce fish with feed, raise the, um, the levels of nutrients in that water and use that water to irrigate crops. It's a type of aquaponics. If you get to a level where it becomes eutrophic and completely polluted, it's going to be good for nothing. Yeah? And it's 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 a question of balance. That is that is the the real question. So. Pond culture, uh, read through the pros and cons, and again, tell me if everything is clear. Gets a bit more complicated now. So. Adrian, yeah. do you think that you can use ponds in aquaponics? I'm just asking because for organic fish farming, I think in Europe, you have to be in ponds. Mm -hmm. We're talking about earth line ponds or plastic line ponds, or it doesn't matter. Yeah. If we want to have aquaponics, organically certified, of course, plant side is one thing, but fish side is another thing. I don't think you'll get a lot of nutrients out of, a, uh, <coughs> out of an earth pond with a low density of fish because the reason that ponds uh, work well at low densities is because there is a balance in that yeah. system. The soil is absorbing and the microbiology and it's releasing and then you've got algal production and it's just fairly balanced. It's, it, 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 and it's a good question because actually we're stuck between a, a, a rock and a hard place. I'm saying humanity is stuck between a rock a, 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 a rock and a hard place. Why? Because if we're going to do everything in a natural manner, there's not going to be enough food for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, scientists, scientists, uh, scientists have, and you can't, you can't predict it exactly. But those that have spent a lot of time trying to work out what is the sustainable carrying capacity of the planet Earth, talk about a million, uh, a billion people. And we're at about 6-7. And the reason that we sustain 6-7 is because we intensified production to levels that are non-sustainable. So, you know, the issue is really not... Uh, it, it, it's not for discussion at the moment. You know, if I got up here and said, okay, we've got to get to... Um, a billion people on the planet, or a politician got up and said that, and then you know they're out of business. So we're not going to do it in a natural way, and that's why it's very important for us to understand what we're doing in aquaponics, because what aquaponics is what aquaponics is a model of is how we're taking on the role of nature and deciding how to deal with this situation. Okay. So. At, at a bureaucratic, uh, uh, the organic certification yeah. level, yeah, you, you, you know, I think, what are you gonna, what's the advantage? You're gonna be able to use the water twice, which is not negligible, but uh, actually getting nutrient recycling under is unlikely.
those levels. Okay, so I didn't go into the RAS system exactly and do pros and cons. I, I basically said what are the key issues in intensifying fish production because what we're actually doing in an aquaponic system is we're intensifying fish production. It doesn't matter if you've got three goldfish in an in a, in a, in a aquarium and a lettuce growing next door or whether you've got 50 tons of sea bass and, uh, and marine algae. It's a balancing act. The whole thing is in a balancing act. And that balancing act has been done in the past in recycled aquaculture systems for fish, but without the plants. And the key issues that came about when intensification was required for fish production was first of all, what is the infrastructure cost? How do you, how do you build this best so that it works efficiently? And how do you do it so that it's economic, that the infrastructure cost does not be so large that it makes it impossible to have a return. And I'm not going to get into the philosophical argument about what it means to have a return or not have a return and what kind of economic system we live in, but we live in a particular economic system that says if you don't make a profit, you don't do it. And that's where we're at. So, in that situation, the first thing you have to do when you go to make intensification is you've got to have a production and marketing plan. You have to know where you're selling your aquaponic <coughs> fish and your aquaponic vegetables, or alternatively, and that's really what's been happening in aquaponics today, you say to yourself, I'm going to give myself some fish and some vegetables for my own use, and for my friend's use, and it doesn't have to be economic. Let's not get into the philosophical view of that, because the question is, can you live off vegetables and fish only, and how are you going to pay for the fish feed that goes in there, and so on and so forth. So, a production and marketing plan is required. Then what we discussed earlier, you have to be aware that maintenance of the water quality and the filtration is the basis of the, the, the game. If you can get your water quality correct, you're fine. And that means that you have to get your filtration right. And that's where the plants come into the story from a, from a fish farmer's point of view. The plants assist in the filtration of the water that goes back to the, to the fish. You're going to run into oxygenation issues very, very soon down the road. You're going to have to deal with nutrition, what feed, what cost of feed, where do you get it from. You're going to have to develop standard operating procedures and you're going to have to know how to handle the, fi the fish and handle the plants and handle the system. And you're going to have to have a plan, a biosecurity plan. And the biosecurity is basically common sense measures, and we'll talk about that today when we talk about diseases after the break. You're going to have some essential elements to setting up your system. You've got to have a decent source of fry, or you've got to have a hatchery of your own. If you don't have a hatchery of your own, you're going to have to know the, 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 the source of the fry and where you're getting it from. You're going to have to be in contact with the hatchery. It's critical that you understand that part of the health of the fish that you grow is dependent on where they were reared. It, it's very simple. We all know that. Uh, we look after our babies in a certain way, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. So, to think that you can go out and buy some fish, stick them in your system, and everything is all right, not a good plan. 
you've got to get into what the source of the feed is, or you've got to produce your own feed. You've got to have a market demand for when the fish get to harvest size and when the plants get to harvest size. No matter if it's eat, you're eating it yourself or if you're selling it out, you've got to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you won't harvest in time, product will build up, you can't put product, you can't put new fingerlings in, the whole thing doesn't work. So you're dealing with something that is very dynamic and you have to be very aware of what's going on. You've got to assess what are your infrastructure requirements, your land, where you're going to get your water from, your energy, how's it going to work, and if you're dealing with a big farm, you've got to work out how you're going to run it from a human point of view, from a human resources point of view. And most important, you've got to sit down and you've got to do a simulation. And you've got to do it again and again and again and again. And you've got to refine it. And you've got to see this, and it doesn't matter if it's the aquarium and the lettuce in the bedroom, or if it's a commercial farm. You've got to see how you put this together and you have to improve as you go along. And if you're going to do a big big farm or a reasonable farm, reasonable sized farm, and your intention is to go towards producing this for commercial, you have to do a pilot. You have to do a pilot to check all of the above. It doesn't have to be for the full cycle of three years that it takes to get everything in balance, but you have to do a pilot to see what goes wrong. So a little bit more about water quality and filtration. The level of filtration that you're going to need depends on what volume of water you have and your conscience in relation to putting it back into the environment. You can make your plan based on the fact that you're not going to utilize more than the water that is required minimally and you're going to run a very fine line or that you've got a lot of water exchange and you wash it down the drain, down the toilet, down whatever, into the sewer system. And there's a cost attached to that, so you've got to work that out as well. If you decide that you're going to do a closed system, and I think that in most aquaponic systems that are being attempted and the vision is to get to a closed system, then you're going to need to put more into your filtration. More into how the bacteria do their jobs, more in how you get into your solid waste out, and that's going to require cost. So you've got all of these things to balance. You've got to make a decision early on whether you're going to try to do this organically or you're going to try and do it organically but if in the event of you will use chemicals because the great majority of aquaculture, I'm not talking about aquaponics where you've got both stuck together and I would say agriculture in general Everybody keeps to the rules until they have a very, very difficult situation and they then use the chemical solutions, remedies that are available. And yes, there's reg regulations and yes, yes, there is uh, policing of those regulations but I'm not naive to think, because I've seen it throughout my working life, that those things actually happen. They don't. 
if a farmer has 100 tons of fish and he has an infection of a bacterial infection, he will call in the vet and the vet will say you have to use antibiotics, he will use antibiotics. Sometimes it will be legal, sometimes it won't be legal. This is the way the world works. So each, and your, each on your own is going to have to sit down and make a decision. How are you going to do this? Yeah, Rob. Um, I think it is also important to consider the part of animal welfare. In some cases, you're obliged to treat, uh, treat the fish because you, you can't. You're not yeah. Allowed to let yeah, it's not a simple. It's not a simple answer. Yeah. It's not a simple answer. <laughs> But you see, you, you know as well as I do that the chances of having an infection of Gyrodactyls in a low density is very small, and the, the, the chances of having an infection of Gyrodactyls, one particular uh, parasite of gills of fish, in high densities is very high. And the remedies for treatment of Gyrodactylus are basically illegal. So, as the fish farmer, you're going to have to decide, do I treat or do I leave? Or do I go through a process of catching all the fish, you're in the salt bath, which is legal and better, but then I've got the stress of catching them, I've got the stress of the... Uh, of, of the handling, etc., etc., it's going to create other problems. If you don't balance the system, you're going to have your welfare problems. And if you do do your best to balance the system, you're going to have to be, you're going to have welfare problems, disease problems. What you have to learn is how to balance. And. I have no, rem I have no magic, uh, magic uh, remedy for that, or equation. It just doesn't happen. So we've got the question of oxygenation, that's the first one we reach. <clears throat> it's interesting actually, because oxygenation is probably, or lack of oxygen is probably the one major mortality factor in farms, in aquaria, in, in, in keeping fish in cap captivity. Because the minute you have a high density of fish and you have a oxygenation system that is mechanical, if that breaks down, for whatever reason, whether it's that the uh, electricity went or whether that some water got into the into the pump and burnt it out, or whatever, and you don't have alarms and backups of alarms and backups of backups of alarms, and you didn't get there on time, then your fish are going to die from the lack of oxygen. So oxygenation at the extreme is very important, but also on an ongoing basis, because if there is a low oxygen level, or for instance, when you feed fish, we saw oxygen is taken out of the system. It's taken out of the system pretty much post the feeding. The metabolism of the fish requires the oxygen in order to digest the feed. So the oxygen levels in the tanks go down. If the oxygen level in the tanks goes down every time you feed, it means that your fish are stressed every time you feed. It means that they become, their immune system is reduced and then they become susceptible to all these diseases. So, oxygen is critical. Rob will talk more about oxygen systems, I'm, so, I'm sure. Second, I really want to focus on two areas. One is the water quality, and the other one is the nutrition. Second one is the nutrition. We all know, we are what we eat. We kind of forgot it. McDonald's help us forget it. Um, uh, we, <coughs> we, we are what we eat and the fish are what we eat. So if they get the correct nutrition, then they're fine. Um, 
Nutrition is a combination of many, many things. It's not only the quality of the feed, it's when you feed, it's how you feed, it's how you remove the waste of the feed. We're, I'm going over and over these things again and again. Um, one of the one of the, the nice points about being involved in fish production is that um, the FCR values can be less for one one for fish. They'll range between one and two. There are fish that you get less than one. Most of the fish that you get less than one, and it's interesting because if you look at that. 80% of the fish produced in Asia, out of the 80%, probably 50% of that, in other words, 40% of the fish produced in the world actually are not fed. They grow on natural plankton and algae. The majority of those fish are uh, silver carp, big head carp, grass carp, they're all <coughs> natural feeders. So, what we're doing here is a bit different. We're producing feed to produce the fish, to <coughs> feed the fish. So we need to know what the dietary requirements, I wanted to go into how these are done, a bit more about fish meal, people were talking about fish meal, fish meal is used not only for, there's reasons that fish meal is used in aquaculture diets, in other words taking fish out of and it's generally, it's generally <coughs> the anchovies in the Peru upwelling that are used to produce fish meal. The reason that that is done is because if you take, if you don't have the, the, the uh, fish meal in the feed, then some of the amino acids that the fish require are lacking. Tilapia uh, is a very good fish. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't require so much fish meal. It doesn't require any fish meal. As long as you supply, I think it's lysine and one other amino acid from another source, you can use soya only. There are other fish that won't eat soya, but tilapia will eat soya. I produced so uh, um, tilapia in India on 100% soya. Um, very efficiently at a very low cost, below 40 cents. For all other reasons that, that we don't want to go into, but it's possible to get to a diet of fish that is basically not taking into fish. Um, yeah. And the FCR was good or so, and the fish quality. The FCR was yeah. was reasonable. One, one, you know, between one and two, and it's it's a good question in that. Uh, what what we, is FCR? FCR. 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 Yes. It's an, it's it's interesting, but uh, there's there is an organization called the American Association of Soya Growers, <laughs> and um, they don't want China and India to compete with their market in America. They've had their market. They produce. They. They maintain their prices by the system that they produce them. They simply don't want competition from. And they, the way they do it is they say, we will make sure that in China and in India, they use their own soil. So they spent a lot of money in putting up, in supporting the development of feed mills and technology, <coughs> technology in India and in China to use the local soya to produce feed that can feed the fish, the cattle, the poultry, uh, and therefore there will be no soya to export to America and it will not compete in their market. And I actually think that that's fine. Huh? It's kind of sustainable. It's kind of sustainable. It's kind of sustainable, exactly. Yeah. Um, I don't know how ethical it is, it that, that's a different question, but bottom line it's kind of sustainable and what they've managed to do as a result of that 
is that there are feed mills in, in China and India and they're growing all the time that use the majority of the local soya for their own livestock production. It doesn't mean that they do that in America, but they can still buy fish meal and so on and so forth, but they're making sure that the soya doesn't come to them. Okay, one, I'm going to go over um, a few of the species, the main species that, to me, you know, I was asked, list all the species. There's probably somewhere around 250 species of fish that are farmed. And out of the 250, I would say today, and I'm just shooting from the hip, about 200 of them have a closed cycle. In other words, people know how to take broodstock, mother and father fish, maintain them in a uh, artificial situation, and produce <coughs> the fry from those fish. But uh, I'm not going to go through the 250, and I'm not going to say to. I'm not going to go into how we, how one chooses this. Um, what fish to grow in one, in, in one system, but um, these are the main fish that I would think are candidates for for aquaponic systems that are early day starters for aqua, uh, aquaponic systems. And that's my opinion. There are other people who think other fish and, and it, everything is uh, everything is legitimate on the basis that one has to trial and see what happens. But in the warm water tropical range, which we're talking about um, fish mortality at around 12, 13 degrees and below, fish happy about 18 degrees, fish, I'm talking centigrade, obviously, uh, fish feeding well from 21 to 25 degrees and fish surviving okay at the higher temperatures. The, that's the list that, that I would start with now in aquaponics. In temperate climates where you're going to get that type of temperature and you're also going to get lower temperatures and you might have to put in some heating to support that then we're talking fish like the hybrid striped bass, carps, there are a few others. There's a jade perch, it's a minor species. There are many others. In very cold water situations where the temperatures don't go above 18 degrees, then it's probably trout, salmon smolts, pipe perch, zander, fish that are naturally in cold water. And I'm sure that you will have another list to add to that. There is a combination of three factors. There are pathogens and there is a host and there is an environment. And the three of those things interact together. And disease is where it's out of balance. So, diagnosis and measurement of the presence of pathogens doesn't necessarily indicate disease. What indicates disease is when the three factors here are out of balance. And we seem to think that we can get rid of the pathogens. We seem to think that we can be immune hosts. But actually the only thing that we can affect is the environment. So Yes, it's important to understand about the pathogens. It's important to understand how the process works 
within the host, but have no doubt that the first line of defense is to be able to affect the environment that we are giving organisms to live in, and if we can get that right, then the pathogens and the host will be in a balance that means that you will not have disease. If your environment is out of kilter, the disease will appear. That's, but that is, in a nutshell, the management of disease in aquaculture and in aquaponics. In the uh, 90s, I was involved and I was telling you today how you have to sit down and work out what you're going to do and you've got to do a pilot and so on. I'm going to show you a, a small video of an RAS system that I set up in the UK. The logic behind it was that tilapia was imported to the UK on aeroplanes from Jamaica and Ecuador, and the cost of tilapia in the supermarket in the UK, if you went back down the various stages, was 30% marketing profit to the supermarket, 20% to the airlines for flying the fish from uh, wherever they came from, another 20% to the processors and the distributors, and somewhere at the end of all of that, the farmer got what he got. And the logic behind it was, let's grow tilapia in the UK and supply it to the uh, supermarkets from a farm that used waste heat from a power station which was being thrown into a river and use a fish that was ecologically sound, that didn't require a lot of fish meal. And um, I'm going to show you the uh, hype video that was produced on that particular uh, venture. We had to close down the farm because the supply of the hot water became unavailable because the um, manufacture of cigarette filters, which was the core business of this particular factory, was moved to China. Because in the world that we live in at the moment, if you can find somewhere where you can get cheap labor and uh, produce something cheaper and then ship it, it's a lot better. But it was a uh, interesting uh, venture and I'm going to show you. This is one of England's largest textile plants and there's something very fishy going on. See what I mean? There's more fish to be caught here than most people have had hot dinners. Binfuls of them. This is the tilapia fish, a native of Africa. It's referred to in St. Matthew's Gospel. Jesus told Peter to cast a hook into the warm waters of the Sea of Galilee to obtain a piece of silver with which to pay the Romans. Hence the common name of the fish, St. Peter's fish. So what is a freshwater fish foreign to northern climes doing in a place like this? This is Pisces aquaculture in Derby, the brainchild of marine biologist Adrian Barnes. He recognized the potential that existed in the textile plant's effluent. Clean, fresh, hot water. 
Cold water drawn from the nearby river Derwent is used to cool certain industrial processes. The water gets hot and must be cooled before it can be returned to the river, a process which could itself be costly. Now though, Pisces Aquaculture take that hot water and pump it round the fish ponds, which act like huge radiators, dissipating the heat before it's returned to the river. And the tilapia love temperatures of 26 degrees Celsius, so everybody's happy, including the young fry, who in their early days are closely looked after by mother. At the first sign of trouble, she scoops the kids up into her mouth. Don't swallow them, Mum. Feeding time is around the clock. They're fed mainly on a diet of soya-based vegetable protein, an economic and environmentally sound form of food. Before the now cooled water can go back into the river, any ammonia which is toxic to fish is removed. Good housekeeping is ensured by three filtration processes. First, a rotating drum filters out any solid waste. Then the roots of water hyacinths help convert ammonia into nitrates. And finally, a bed of stones harbors bacteria which take out any remaining pollutants. In the breeding ponds, the sex of the young fry is controlled through hormone feeding. Then they're closely monitored in an indoor rearing tank. Finally, they're put into the outdoor tanks full of hot water. These fish reach maturity at around eight months and that's when the big juicy ones are creamed off. They just lower the level of the water tank and scoop them up. And then it's off to the packing plant. There's a big future for this fish as a food in the UK. In their first year, this company produced 120 tons of St. Peter's fish. And their target over the next five years is to reach 3,000 tons. And in the UK, one of the largest supermarket chains is selling this exotic homegrown catch at an affordable price. It looks good, it tastes good. And with a name like St Peter's Fish, it must be good. Many things have changed there. I, mean, I haven't seen this way for a while. For instance, the hormonal feeding is not the way we do it nowadays. In tilapia, it's done through uh, combining various species so that you get an all-male uh, population. In tilapia production, if you have uh, female fish growing, they basically breed, and you end up with millions of fish. So you have to try and keep a male population only. Um, I just wanted you to see that uh, because that's a large RAS system that worked but the economics of getting the hot water supply was critical and it wasn't under my control and therefore that never went forward and so when one looks at the aspects of setting up an aquaculture, aquaponic system, you have to look at all of the aspects and some of them you can't look at <laughs> exactly and it changes. So uh, I'm deeply indebted to all of you for coming and for listening to my uh, ranting on. I think that the future of aquaponics is in your hands. Uh, I have an email which Vesna will disseminate to you at any stage that you uh, require assistance or a question and uh, I'm there and I'll be happy to answer if I can, depending on time and I hope that you create a wonderful 
future for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.